I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today, Rolling the ADA Forward, Therapist Improving Access to Mobility Equipment. And um, this webinar is brought to you by the Clinician Task Force. Our facilitator today is Kathy Carver, and she's going to introduce the rest of the panel in just a few minutes. We would like to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy day to attend. Just remember that this webinar is available for 0.1 CEU credit. You can go back to the NARTS website, log in. You'll be in your learning portal. Go to Enrolled Courses, and you can take the quiz there. And tomorrow, the recorded version of this webinar will also be available in that learning portal. If you have time, you can browse through the NARTS course library. You'll see lots of your colleagues and friends' names listed as presenters in our course library. NARTS uses many, many clinicians, uh, people that you know in the industry to host and present for us. So be sure and check that out. Uh, Kathy, we are so happy to have all of you with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you so much, Annette, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, happy CRT Awareness Week. Uh, what a great week we've had so far. Uh, uh, NCART and NARTS and United Spinal and CTF and all the other major organizations taking time out this week to bring awareness to complex rehab technology. Uh, there's been focus on the suppliers, on the consumers, on the manufacturers, and today uh, we take a look at the role of the clinician uh, in the provision of CRT. So uh, by way of acknowledging the CRT Awareness Week, the CTF wanted to put together a webinar today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, kind of spinoff of the celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act that was passed. Uh, 30 years ago, we want to talk a little bit about how we engage clinicians to move that forward. Uh, I think we all acknowledge that things have improved, and we all acknowledge there's improvement to be done. So we want to talk a little bit today about where we've been and where we're going and the role of the clinician in that. Uh, and all of you on this call uh, will get an opportunity to actively participate in that. So thanks for being here, and I'm excited about our panel today uh, and all we're going to get to talk about. So moving on. I did want to take just a brief opportunity to tell you about the Clinician Task Force. For those of you who do not know who we are, uh, we are a group of clinicians, occupational therapists, physical therapists around the country. You see that great map uh, right there in all of those green states is where we have members. The, uh, the white or gray, grayed out states, we do not have members there. So if you're listening and are in one of those states and you like what you hear today and you want to get involved with us, uh, you can go, with our, go to our website and learn a little bit more and, and uh, fill out a membership application. But the gist of what we do is we get our, our hands dirty and our feet wet uh, in, when it has to do with our patients who need complex rehab technology. We are active in four different areas. Uh, the federal legislative uh, perspective, we're active at the state level for Medicaid coverage issues and access issues. Uh, we are active in uh, Medicare coverage issues. Primarily, one of the biggest things we've worked on recently is helping to uh, be involved with the coverage criteria and support for power seat elevation and power standing. So uh, that's been a neat place for us to be involved. And then our other focus and priority is educating, if you will, the next generation. Uh, many of us, including myself, uh, got into uh, CRT and seating and wheel mobility a little bit later in my career. Uh, and so we have a, a way for people to get involved later. And then we have uh, members working on getting education into the academic setting uh, so we can influence our up and coming uh, therapists uh, from the beginning. So it's a really neat group. It's a place for everybody if you wanna get involved uh, and you can read more about us on the website. But that's enough about us. Um, let's get down to kind of what we came to talk about today. I wanna introduce you to some very fine people. Uh, Jenny Lieberman is an occupational therapist at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, Maggie Dotlin is a physical therapist at Craig Hospital in Colorado. You're gonna hear today from Joe Nara, who works for Powers Law Firm in Washington, DC. You're gonna get to hear from Erin Michael, a physical therapist at Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And then finally, this is the big win. Jenny Siegel's with us today, you guys. 
Uh, she is uh, the recent uh, recipient of the NARC uh, Consumer Advocate uh, of the Year Award and is uh, somebody I can't wait to get back together with in person, spend some time with and learn some more from her. So she's gonna bring us home at the end and talk to us and I, I can't wait to hear from her. Uh, so this is a star-studded cast, and so I hope you're uh, looking forward to the next hour. Uh, what we want to accomplish today, just kind of want to run through this so you'll know what you're getting into, uh, is we want you to have a little better understanding of what it means to get legislation through the process for people who need complex rehab technology. It's a daunting process. There's terms that get thrown out there, and we want you to have a little bit better understanding of what that legislative process is and what it means for our people who need CRT. We wanna give you something to walk away with today or roll away with as well. Uh, three, we want you to have at least three resources that you can use immediately uh, to get involved. And then we also want you to talk, uh, be able to have at least one or two ways that you can implement how you wanna advocate for people who need CRT. So it'll be fun today and it'll be a practical too. So we're gonna start with Joe Nara with Powers Law Firm. He's gonna lay the groundwork for us, if you will. He's gonna give us some history uh, of Medicare, where it started, how we, where we are today, and where we need to go for our friends that need complex rehab technology. So he's gonna give us to a little um, schoolhouse rock version of uh, passing a bill through the legislative process and uh, kind of get us caught up of where we as clinicians can plug in. So we're gonna bring on Joe to talk to us a little bit about what how we start out by getting a bill passed through the process and what that means. So Joe, take it away. Well, thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks to everyone at the, the task force and NARCS and NCART for handling CRT awareness and for putting on this webinar. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, I'm the Director of Government Relations of Powers Law Firm here in DC. Uh, at Powers, we represent a variety of organizations in the disability and rehabilitation space, uh, as well as operating several coalitions. And one of those is the ITEM Coalition, uh, which has about 90 national nonprofit members, including the Clinician Task Force, NARTS, and NCART. Uh, and at the ITEM Coalition, we focus on increasing access to assistive devices and technologies for beneficiaries of federal programs, uh, especially Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so as Kathy mentioned, I'd like to start with a little brief overview of the legislative process. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, some may not. Uh, but of course, first for uh, any bill to be passed, you have to start with an idea. And this could be a new service or a new program for the government to provide, uh, or most often a solution to a problem that exists. Uh, and these ideas can really come from anywhere and advocates like yourselves, like the people on this call are, are really a great source for identifying solutions to the problems in the field. Uh, once there's an idea for a bill, a congressional sponsor in either the House or the Senate uh, drafts and introduces legislative language. Uh, this can be created within one office among multiple offices uh, or in conjunction with federal agencies or external organizations like the ones putting on this webinar. Once a bill is introduced, uh, it gets directed to one or more committees based on the areas it would impact. Uh, for healthcare issues, the committees of jurisdiction are usually the finance or the health, education, labor, and pensions committees in the Senate uh, and the ways and means or energy and commerce committees in the House. Uh, the committees and, and their subcommittees do a review and debate the bill and usually hold what's called a markup session to offer amendments before voting to approve the bill uh, for consideration on the House or Senate floor. Uh, and as Kathy mentioned, this process can often take quite a long time and there's actually no guarantee that every bill does get considered by the full chamber. Uh, so once a bill gets introduced, it's really important for advocates and other supporters of the bill to assist the congressional sponsors uh, in gaining additional support for the bill via new co-sponsors and demonstrating public awareness and approval of the bill. And that's what we call a grassroots support. Um, both the House and the Senate have to pass a bill in order to advance it out of Congress. Uh, often the same bill will be introduced in both chambers as companion bills. Uh, but if the House and Senate do pass different versions, Congress has to create a conference committee to agree on a compromise that can pass uh, out of the full Congress. Uh, in most cases, a bill is passed by a simple majority vote in the House and the Senate. Uh, but as some of you may be aware, the Senate has rules, uh, including the filibuster, which often mean that controversial bills have to get at least 60 votes in favor to pass. Uh, once Congress passes a bill, it goes to the White House for review. Uh, if the president approves of the bill and signs it, it becomes law and the process is complete. Uh, otherwise, the president can veto a bill, uh, in which case Congress has to try to override that veto uh, by a two-thirds majority vote in both Congress, in both chambers. Uh, if that happens, then the bill does become law, even over the president's objections. 
Uh, so now that we've got a, a little brief overview of that schoolhouse rock level of the legislative process, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Medicare program and uh, where, where it's come from and, and where we're going from here. So the Medicare program was signed into law uh, by President Lyndon Johnson in 1965. And since its start, uh, Medicare has included coverage for durable medical equipment uh, or DME. Uh, in 1987, the DME benefit as we know it today was created, uh, and that combined DME, prosthetics and orthotics, and related supplies into the DME POS benefit, or what we call DMEPOS. Uh, this includes six categories of covered equipment, uh, which are paid for uh, via what's called a fee schedule, uh, and that's a formula to calculate the set prices for each category of equipment. Uh, DME under Medicare is defined uh, really under four prongs, uh, and that's equipment that can withstand repeated use, uh, equipment that primarily serves a medical purpose, uh, equipment that's appropriate for use in the home, uh, and equipment that is generally not useful for someone who does not have an illness or injury. Uh, DME is a very broad category, uh, and that includes inexpensive or more standardized items, including crutches, hospital beds, crane, canes and walkers, uh, oxygen and oxygen equipment, prosthetic limbs and orthotic braces, uh, and supplies such as surgical dressings and some drugs and biologics, including immunosuppressants. Um, and as many of you may know, complex rehabilitation technology is included under the DME benefit. Certainly as clinicians and consumers will be aware though, there's a big difference between a basic wheelchair that a patient receives to leave the hospital after a, a surgery uh, and a group three power wheelchair uh, that's used primarily by permanently non-ambulatory patients. Uh, however, even though those are very different, CMS covers them under the same regulatory structure. Uh, and that's really what we want to talk about today. Um, this broad structure of the DME benefit provides some significant barriers to access uh, for the most complex and customized equipment like CRT, uh, which again is largely regulated under the same rules as standardized and inexpensive items. Uh, now, Joe, I'm going to ask here, you talked about some of these significant barriers for access. Can you give us just one or two examples of what those barriers are before we go forward? Absolutely. Uh, going back to those four prongs that I mentioned, uh, one of those barriers is the, quote, primarily medical in nature designation. Uh, many forms of DME uh, that clinicians and, and consumers would certainly consider crucial for beneficiaries' health and function are actually considered non-covered under the DME benefit because CMS, the agency that oversees the Medicare program, uh, views them as convenience items rather than primarily medical. Uh, Kathy talked earlier about uh, standing and seat elevation systems, uh, and CMS currently views those as non-medical, uh, even though, again, I, I think most of the people on this call would really think that those are, are absolutely crucial for health and function. Um, one other requirement is the in-the-home requirement. Uh, the legislative text that originally created this requirement has now been interpreted by CMS uh, very narrowly to only cover DME only that is used in the home. So for example, a wheelchair that a beneficiary uses to get around in the community, you know, c conduct their errands, go get groceries, things like that, uh, are not considered DME under the, the current benefit. Um, and as a side note, uh, we mentioned that it's the 30th anniversary this year of the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's really a community focused legislation and is focused on increasing the people with disabilities participation and integration into the community. The Medicare benefit is not structured that way and, it, and is really structured to, to focus in the home. Well, it uh, sounds like we need something different. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great segue. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, as everyone knows, CRT uh, does require significant clinical and supplier support and services in the provision of these items, including evaluations and technology assessments, training for the beneficiaries. Um, but the DME benefit, as it stands, does not really recognize these crucial services. And so because of that, uh, advocates, including the organizations on this call, have long pushed for what's called a separate benefit category, or SBC, uh, to allow for policies that would more appropriately govern access to CRT. Uh, a separate benefit category would recognize the clinical services that go along with the actual equipment of CRT itself. Uh, it would do away with the in-the-home requirement, and it would open the door to coverage of more critical integrated systems like standing and seat elevation. Uh, with, an, with a separate benefit category, CRT would be moved outside of the existing uh, DME benefit uh, and improve the coverage and coding and quality standards that are, are used for CRT. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with the current legislation uh, that's in the, in the House to try to enact in a separate benefit category. Uh, that's HR 2408, the Ensuring Access to Quality CRT Act of 2019. 
Uh, that's sponsored by representatives Jim Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin and Brian Higgins of New York. Uh, and that's been a, a really major legislative priority for the Clinician Task Force, for the Item Coalition, for NCART, uh, and a lot of these organizations in the field. Um, I'll also briefly mention that uh, CRT is not the only category that's looking for a separate benefit category. Uh, the O&P or orthotics and prosthetics field is also looking to distinguish themselves legislatively from DME. Uh, for prosthetic limbs and orthotic braces, there's a lot of the similar clinical services and requirements for fittings and refinements that are required um, and treating them as, as really standardized so-called off-the-shelf equipment is not really appropriate for O&P either. Well, I would say if O&P could do it, we could do it. Absolutely, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. That's right. So tell us where we as clinicians can, can make our voice most appropriate along this way. Absolutely. And, and I will say that the rest of the panelists are really going to talk about their experience with advocacy and then they're going to be able to share their experience, which is really great. Um, clinicians, consumers are, are really critical to developing policy that enhances the access to CRT and advances the field. Um, advocacy allows clinicians and consumers to have a voice in identifying the policy needs, developing the solutions, uh, refining the legislative proposals that come out of Congress, as well as just educating lawmakers in the field. You know, not everyone is as familiar with CRT as the experts that are on this call. Um, there are really so many opportunities to get involved in advocacy, and we really encourage everyone on this call to try to raise their voice in support of CRT. Um, CRT patient-centered policy is really the goal, uh, and advancing that through advocacy helps patients and providers. Um, the patients, of course, uh, we want to see increased access to the care uh, and equipment that they need, uh, but as well as the providers on this call will be well aware, you know, you have to spend a lot of your time uh, fighting with Medicare, with insurance companies that often take their cues from Medicare to try to get that access, and so uh, that's why we, as a field, really need to come together and support these legislative goals. Well, sometimes getting involved in this legislative stuff can, can make you a little nauseated or a little confused or a little bit, um, you know, like that's just too big for me. You know, I've got a lot going on, write my own notes. I got, you know, family at home. I got all this going on, but then you have that nagging, you know, in your head and in your heart of, I really need to do something, but I don't know where to get started. Uh, so if anybody out there can identify with me, on that and uh, some of these clinicians on this call, um, you'll get a chance to listen to uh, Jenny Lieberman first. Uh, she's uh, an occupational therapist at Mount Sinai in New York. I want to introduce you to her and uh, we'd like to hear from her first on how she got involved with advocating uh, for her patients. Uh, Jenny, will you share with us? Yeah, so I, um, um, I'd say some, somewhere around 2004, the Medicaid offices in New York City shut down and they moved their office up to Albany. And when they did that, they really started denying a lot of items for us. Their, their philosophy was that um, people down in Manhattan didn't really know how to do it. So, um, you know, they knew how to do it up, upstate. So they, they began denying things just like tires or you had to go through a really long process just to get repairs. And so our consumers were stuck in the home. They were calling us. They couldn't get out. Their batteries were dead. And sometime in... I'd say 2004, 2005, there was a hearing that was held with a lot of the local legislators and, and several clinicians and consumers went down to speak. And it was, it was the first time that I went. I, I uh, was hesitant because I had never done anything like this before. And uh, I was really nervous. And uh, I was encouraged by some of my really good local um, friends and, and, and people in the industry and it was, it was no doubt, it was terrifying. I mean, the, the first time is scary. Um, I got up there, I, um, I, you know, I, 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 I sat down, I pulled it together, I said what I wanted to say, um, got a migraine. Um, but, but when all was said and done, I was really happy that I had done it. Um, you know, because it just really made me feel like, okay, maybe this can be the beginning of something better. Was well, your employer supportive of you getting involved with advocacy? So this is a valuable lesson for anybody who wants to get involved in advocacy. My immediate employers were very supportive. My managers were really supportive. Um, they gave me time to go. Um, but I, I had done something at one point in time, I believe it was when we were working on the, um, the accessories bill for, for power. 
um, when we were talking about the issues with power and making sure that, that power electronics weren't going to be involved. Um, and uh, I had sent a, an email to somebody who I'd become friendly with in Gillibrand's office. Um, you know, we have this 5 p.m. deadline. Can you get her to sign on? And she forwarded it up, and, and that made it to my the presence office of the hospital, um, who didn't really know that I was doing these things. And it sort of made it through the chain to the lobbying department of the hospital. And so I had to sit down and have a meeting with them and, and sort of explain that um, I wasn't lobbying to to our, our, our legislator. I was just sort of speaking out for the members of our hospital, for our, our patients and our consumers. And, and so I haven't had a problem since then, but it's a lesson mm -hmm. to learn in that, you know, if you're going to go ahead and you're going to, you're going to really get involved with this, really be aware of, of all aspects of, of how it can affect where you're working and, and your environment. Now, Jenny, have you had the chance to go to Capitol Hill? What was that I, like? I have. I have, I, um, I love it. I go twice a year. My favorite event um, out of anything is the role on Capitol Hill. And really just because it's, you know, the Capitol is loaded with consumers up there, people, you know, living their life, they're in their equipment, they're going to legislator's office. Um, this picture of me is with um, a, a young man I've known since 2003, um, who now actually works at United Spinal. Um, and it was his first time there and, uh, um, I, I go twice a year. I love it. I, I pay for a lot of it out of my own pocket, but I'm, I love doing it that it's really worth, worthwhile for me. So if you had any tips to share with clinicians who kind of just want to take first steps, what would you tell them? Um, it's going to be scary, right? You know, um, but, um, you know, you should always, um, really kind of, if, if going to the big thing is hard for you, start, start at home, you know, go to your local legislator's office, you know, start a conversation with them, tell them who you are, what you do, invite them to come see your clinic and just sort of start local and then you can move up from there. Um, you know, be courageous. This isn't really about us. This is, this is really about our, our, our consumers, our patients. So, you know, just kind of don't think about it personally. Um, you know, that Jose, you know, that was his first time going and he goes all the time now and he now works United Spinal. I mean, we have the ability to affect our consumers' lives. I mean, we have the ability to change the way they see themselves and what they're capable of doing. We have the way to change um, legislation and, and really continue to fight for what people need. Um, be honest and truthful. Don't, you know, make up dramatic stories. I mean, be really honest and forward about what, what the process is, what's going on, how people are affected, and, and share facts and data. And you can go to um, NCART, Access for CRT, the Clinician's Task Force, United Spinal. I mean, you can find all these different resources and data on all of these areas in terms of, in terms of legislation, in terms of what, are, what, what access needs are in the moment. One of the things I've heard Jenny say is we all started from somewhere in our advocacy adventure. It just takes one step. Uh, she's exactly right. Um, so we all have sweaty armpits when we send that first email or make that first call trying to figure out what to say, but it, it kind of lights you up when you actually see that it matters. Uh, and speaking of seeing things come to fruition and things that matter, Erin uh, Michael uh, is going to share with us how she got started. Uh, and give us a little bit about her story of getting involved. Erin, uh, tell us what, 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 where you got started. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I started working up in a clinic outside of Boston, Massachusetts, actually very early in my career. Um, in a, I got into seating and wheelchair prescription. Um, and right away, I realized that something was wrong. Um, how come it takes a lot more than me saying my patient is non-ambulatory, as in they cannot walk, they have a spinal cord injury, they have a brain injury, they have whatever diagnosis. That should be, to me, <laughs> that should be the end of it. Why do I have to go over and over um, the, why, is there, why are there pages upon pages of documentation to prove the necessity of a device for someone who cannot walk? that should be it. They cannot walk the end. They need a wheelchair. Uh, and so I went to some of my mentors and said, you know, where is this coming from? What is the issue? 
And when I found out that it was legislation that was way above me, uh, I said, okay, send me. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I do that? And I think it's mostly driven by my personality as I know many of the other members on the CTF and probably many of the people on this uh, webinar. I just, I don't settle for the status quo. And, and if something's bothering me, I, I can't sit around and complain about it. I have to act. And so I went to the people and said, tell me how to act. Well, these pictures of you so show you in action. You're mighty dressed up, by the way. You don't look like the normal therapist, you know, in khaki pants and tennis shoes and a polo shirt or scrubs like me right now. Tell us where you are in those pictures and what you're doing. Yeah, so that's actually at Kennedy Krieger at our outpatient building. Um, and I've worked alongside with some of the uh, other employees at our facility and in forming relationships with our legislators' offices. Um, and they know us now when I, when we email them or when we visit their office or, you know, they, they recognize us and we've progressed that relationship to them coming to visit us. Um, and so these pictures are from when Senator Van Hollen actually came to our building and we hosted a patient panel uh, or a consumer panel, um, to discuss, actually at this point, it was the need for therapy services because this was during the time of the therapy cap issue. Um, but they've also come, we've also discussed um, DME with them and CRT and many of our consumers were in wheelchairs that day. So they did talk about the need of the equipment as well. So you actually got those guys to come to you? I, we did, yes. <laughs> and um, we actually have had a few come through. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you get that to happen? Like get to, it seems to me that would be difficult. You go through all these channels to make a phone call and then they're busy and all that. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get that to happen? And can another Consist clinician do that? Yes, you can. It's through uh, consistency and persistence. <laughs> um, I think the important thing really, as I was saying, is forming the relationship. Do not let them forget about you. Make sure that you get to a place where, you know, we're, we're at a place now with our offices where when legislation comes out, some of them actually email me and say, hey, did you see this? We, we're signing on to it. We just wanted to make sure you know um, that we're, we're taking action here and um, connecting them to the patient stories. And so we've been, I've been emailing the staffers for these offices and, and interacting directly with the legislators themselves enough that when we say, hey, do you want to come by? They say, yeah, sure, let's do it. Uh, and they schedule when they're in, when they're back home in town for, you know, they, they take breaks or they, they take their, their week back in their home office. And that's when they go around and make all these different stops. Uh, and they actually, that's part of their agenda when they're home is to visit different locations. Uh, and so you can get yourself on that schedule. You just have to ask and keep asking. Um, and that's just keep asking until they say yes. Squeaky wheel. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so so sound, I like your words, consistency and persistency uh, are the excellent approach. Do you have any other tips for clinicians that want to get started with this that may just be completely scared to death to make a phone call yes. to ask you might come by their office or how to get involved? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the big thing is I don't, I don't like to use the word advocacy as often. Um, it's more, think of it as education. It's a chance to teach someone what we know. We're the experts in our field, whatever that, in this case, it's a specialty in CRT. We're, we're the experts in that. Um, and so it's our chance to educate them. I like to think that the decisions that are being made above, above us are not out of malice. It's just out of not knowing. They don't know what they don't know. And so we're there to teach them. Um, and then you don't have to be on the Hill. Um, advocacy can be, like Jenny kind of hinted at, it can be local. Um, you can even start with payers. You can advocate one patient at a time to make sure that with their payers, they're getting the services that they need or the equipment that they need. Um, I 
said this a few times already, but building a relationship. So maintain consistency mm -hmm. and persistence with those offices so they know who you are. And so when these pieces of legislation come up, they have a face in their mind. And more importantly, it's a consumer face. So sharing those consumer stories and getting those consumers to interact with their legislators so that they know this person's face comes to mind when they're going to sign or not sign on to that bill. Um, and then the bigger thing, we've talked a little bit about it being scary. It definitely is scary being uh, in front of them, but they're, they're human too. And if you don't know the answer to a question that they ask you, or if you're not 100% confident in an answer that you wanna give them, you can simply say, let me get back to you. And whenever we visit them or, you know, we get their email addresses uh, and we come back and, and you can email them back an answer. You don't have to know everything the day that you meet with them or the moment that you meet with them. Um, and also the, a lot of time, I mean, the staffers are, the first thing I realized was the staffers were younger than me while I was there. So, um, you know, again, we're the experts in our field. And so, we can teach them things and it's not they're human it's not doesn't have to be as intimidating as we sometimes make it yeah you can always say i'm going to call don playback i'll call you right back right exactly <laughs> or joe i'm going to call joe or joe or peter <laughs> thomas or wheezy walker or jerry dickerson mm -hmm. he knows it all right love yes. you jerry um <laughs> So one thing that we always hear at these conferences, and you know, Aaron had mentioned it not long ago too, was this, if you're not at the dinner table, you'll be on the menu. And uh, we wanna be a part of actually seeing things to come through to fruition, not just talking about it, not just wishing things were better and all that, but actually doing what part we can do. Um, so next, I want you to hear from Maggie Dolan. Uh, Maggie's a PT in Colorado. She's been a member of the Clinician Task Force for about a year and a half. Uh, and she uh, just got started not too long ago getting involved. So I wanted her to tell us uh, how she got started and what kind of what her, a little bit about her story is. And uh, it's a little bit different from the others. So Maggie, will you share with us? Yes, uh, thank you, Kathy. So I'm Maggie, I am a uh, physical therapist at Craig Hospital in Colorado, and I work with ATP every single day and CRT every single day. Um, I think that my initial urge to get involved really came from um, what equipment is covered for my patients and the why that equipment is covered and what are the either current gaps or potential cap gaps kind of coming down the pike, and then what can I do about it? So thinking about what I can do about it, I started getting involved in some uh, research to kind of give backbone data uh, regarding information to be able to take up to the top. And then also my involvement now with the Clinician, clinician Task Force, which I'm excited about. Well, and we are super glad to have you uh, too helping with us. Now, have you been to Capitol Hill? I have not. I, am ex I know. Is that, I would isn't that be... the only way you can make a difference <laughs> is go to the White House and knock the door down? Definitely not. Um, I'm excited to maybe have that opportunity at some point, but I think that there also is a lot of difference that you can make on more of that local level. So whether it be starting from uh, getting in touch with local legislation, as well as involving your peers and your patients. So I think that you know, I just want to encourage you if you're starting to get involved, really starting from the beginning and taking those stepping stones. So will you mind, will you, do you mind sharing with us some of just the things that you guys at Craig have coordinated doing there on the local level that maybe other clinicians can do also? Yeah, so I think it's easy. There's resources available to make it easy for anybody to call in or to send a letter to local legislation. So starting there and then educating my colleagues to do the same and educating people about what CRT is. Um, and then involving my patients and encouraging them to tell their story and share their stories. Yes. Um, from our perspective at Craig, I think, you know, organizing, you could organize a call-in day. Um, I've worked with our media department to try to kind of get the word about what CRT is out there. So, so media, organizing call-in days, using some of the resources that are already out there. And like Aaron said, building those relationships locally, right? Uh, all 
makes a difference. Um, do you have any tips for other tips for clinicians out there that you would say that might be like, that's for other people. I just, I've got too much to do. It's just, I'm going to let somebody else do that. Yeah. Well, I think there's can be a misconception about uh, starting from that local level. So using the resources that we have available, um, access to CRT through NCART, and that it is not time consuming to make that initial call and it's easy and just go for it. Um, and then again, just educating everybody around you to do the same. I think there can be a lot of volume with the numbers that you can create. And then from a patient perspective, I feel like we have a right and responsibility to really tell our patient stories and tell the information about what CRT access really ensures them from an independent standpoint and getting that message out there and having them do the same. Well, it's amazing each conversation you have with a patient trying to explain to them what, how Medicare currently views their disability and equipment and what's possible. Uh, it's just kind of one of those everyday, every appointment type conversations that you have. And each one of those conversations gets easier, you get more efficient with it, and you get a little bit more confident with it. And uh, it kind of becomes part of your daily practice. Uh, I was, quick story, was at dinner with my family the other night, I am married and I have a 10-year-old and 7-year-old, and I thought, I'm going to try to explain this to my 7-year-old, and as I went through, this is what's going on, this is not, and he goes, that's stupid, mom, I was like, okay, if a 7-year-old can get it, then surely we can explain it, right, um, well, uh, thank you, Maggie, for telling us a little bit about your story, and I like your words about it is our right and responsibility, you know, these folks on Capitol Hill work for us, right, taxpayers that's us though they they have to make time for us to hear what's going on and, and with their constituents uh, so i appreciate that and uh you get a chance to work with jenny siegel correct i have had so, the opportunity yes so what a what a, an amazing opportunity you have uh jenny siegel thank you for being with us today uh cannot wait to hear from you and i have a question for you is who is that little girl on our screen there well, that is me, Kathy, and thank you. You're for adorable. Well, thanks. I'll take that. But um, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. But yes, that is me. Um, I was actually the first child in the state of Colorado to get an electric wheelchair at the age of two. Um, I was originally paralyzed at nine months of age from transverse myelitis. Um, I was, I'm an incomplete C4, C5 quad. I was originally paralyzed from my neck down, so I had no upper body mobility whatsoever. And I always had a very driven, get up and go attitude, and I'm very blessed that I have a wonderful family. And my mom's sitting right here, so I just sold her out, but she's right here. But um, she kept telling, you know, my therapist and my doctors that, you know, this little girl needs the correct equipment because mm -hmm. I couldn't be independent and I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And I was literally driving her and my dad crazy because they could not keep up with me and get me to do the things that I wanted to do for myself. So um, I was very blessed. I was very lucky. And I was given a, or I was able to get an electric wheelchair at the age of two. So how important, or, or tell us about how you became aware that you were going to need to speak up for yourself about your need for this complex rehab technology, not just the DME that everybody told you was covered, but what right. about what you needed so you could function? How, how did you get to the point to speak up for yourself? Well, the, the good thing about, again, my, my upbringing and my family is I've, I've always spoken up for myself, and that's what I've always been taught. Um, when I was in third grade, I spoke in front of the Joint Budget Committee um, to get the care that I needed in school, and that's so that I, could, that I could get the rights to go to a mainstream school. Um, they didn't want me to go to my quote-unquote home middle school because um, a kid went there before I did, and unfortunately, he um, had a different type of disability than I did, and he was not always aware of what was going on, and unfortunately, he fell down a, a flight of stairs, and so because he, the person that was in care of him wasn't fully paying attention, and so um, I've, I've always spoke up because I, even when I was 13, 14 years old, and eight years old at the Joint Budget Committee, I, I never understood, like, why is this stuff not done? Why isn't it something that is something that's available to me and my mom always told me you know she could speak up for me she could do it but she said no Jenny you're gonna go with me you're 
and I did not understand why I didn't get to go to my home middle school. I didn't understand why they were going to bust me halfway across town just so that I could go to the quote unquote accessible school and leave all my friends and leave uh, my sister and everybody else I grew up with. So um, I've always spoke up, but uh, Getting more specifically into complex creative technology, I got involved because of Tom Hetzel. I worked very closely with him with Aspen Seating and Ride Design. And one time I was there for one of my appointments and he was like, you know what, Jenny, I really want to get you involved with CELA. And that's what it was back then. And I was, you know, advocating for complex re technology. I was very blessed and I was very lucky to be rewarded a scholarship for the upcoming conference that year. And I went and I'm telling you, it was honestly the, the best thing I've ever done because it, it, it's my livelihood. And if I don't advocate for this type of equipment, I mean, who else will? I know there's support out there, but it, it's, it's what affects me directly. And so if I can't tell my story, you know, who's going to tell it better than myself. So once I got the opportunity presented by Tom, it's something that I've done uh, very consistently ever since. And it's, it's became like a third job for me. So it's, I'm blessed to do it. And I, I, I love every bit of it. So tell me when you are interacting with other people with disabilities that need CRT and they're not involved with advocacy, what do you tell other people with disabilities about how to get involved and why that is important for them? The main thing is that I always tell them it, it, it's easier than you think. I mean, you definitely have to have your facts and figures correct and you need to know what you're going in there and speaking about and what you're fighting for. But honestly, for me, the biggest impact that I always see is when I can tell my story. Because when I tell my story and say, hey, this power wheelchair not only gets me around, but it allows me to go to work. I work almost two full-time jobs and I own my own home and I own my own van. And these are things that I want to do. I want to be a taxpayer. I want to contribute to society. And I don't want to have to not be able to do those things. And without the correct equipment, I could also be more of a debt because I could get pressure sores. I could be in the hospital. I could have to have surgeries for these pressure sores, things that I don't want to do. I don't want to be down for. So when I go into those meetings and tell them, and not only tell them, but show them, say, you see how the seating system is conformed to my body? It fits just me. It's made just for me. So when I tell them these things, it opens their eyes. And I remember one of the first meetings that I ever went to, we were meeting with um, the legislative aide literally in the hall in DC, because that happens a lot. Um, and I showed him the tilt system on my chair. I showed him how the seating system protects me and my skin. And, and he was in awe. He really was shocked that, oh my goodness, this stuff really is made specifically just for you. And I said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm very petite. I'm very small. You can't send me to Walgreens and grab me a chair off the shelf because I, I, I can't utilize it. I can't use it. Every, yeah, it might have wheels, but I'm not going to be able to do anything that I do without the equipment that I'm sitting in right now. So to be able to show them and tell them that, that's a huge thing for me. So th that would be one of the main things is, you know, it's easier than you think and to tell your story, tell your story because that's what's gonna make the impact. And I've been back and forth to DC for almost 10 years now and I've established relationships. And when I walk into Senator, it was back with Senator ben Bennett and his assistant was Rohini. She came in and she was like, oh, Jenny, how's that job with the Rockies? And how are you doing? Is, is everything still going good? You make these personal connections. And when you make those personal connections, it makes it easier. And then you also feel like, oh, wow, what I said did make a difference. What I said did really touch home with some people. So uh, telling those stories and then, you know, I, I get to work with suppliers, clinicians, uh, Maggie and I were working on putting, uh, getting me in my new wheelchair. We're working on getting that done right now. And, you know, we all need each other. We all go hand in hand, you know, without my suppliers, without my clinicians, I wouldn't have the access to the equipment that I need. And, you know, Maggie, without having, you know, patients like myself, who is she going to be helping out and who is she going to be treating? So, you know, it, it, it's a relationship that basically it's kind of like the circle of life in a way, you know, we all keep each other going. And, and as you know, it's been mentioned, more voices, the better. And when we can all just build off of people's momentum and what people are saying, it's, it, it makes it easier. And honestly, like everybody that I've interacted with, it's almost became like a second family to me. People are so supportive and everybody's fighting for the same goal. So is it intimidating in the beginning? Absolutely. And I've been advocating literally my whole life, but the first time I, you know, 
arrived at DC, I was nervous as heck. And I didn't want to say the wrong things whatsoever. And as soon as I walked out of my first meeting, I looked at my mom and Claudia was with us. And I was like, did I say the right things? Was, was, was that good? And they're like, you did everything you needed to do. I mean, it's, it's telling your story. It's telling your story and what this equipment does for you and, and what will happen to you without it. And I, I learned that very, very quickly. And again, having the facts is important too, but the impact of what CRT does for each individual, I really think that that's what the difference is. Well, and I think your angle of this is what it does for me, and this is what's gonna happen if I don't have access to it. You know, access to the skilled clinicians, the skilled suppliers, the right equipment that's built for you and that has funding for it. I mean, that kind of equipment is not the same as DME and shouldn't be even uh, reimbursed the same. Uh, so taking both those angles is very, very important. So I hope this has primed your pump, everybody on this webinar, because you're about to get a chance to actually do something about it. And you can feel accomplished today, as if you do not already, uh, is to get a chance to take some action together. So in, in honor of CRT Awareness Week and for all clinicians out there fighting the good fight, like we are serious about this. So if you will, uh, go ahead and pull out your phone or your tablet or your computer and go with all of us right now, 150, 200, however is on this call, I don't really know, uh, but go to protectmymobility.org. Like I'm watching all of you right now. I can see your phones and computers and scroll down there and enter your information. And you're gonna see uh, something that we are currently working on right now. And I'm gonna pitch it back to Joe to tell you a little bit about the letter you'll find there on protectmymobility.org, what's in it and what you're actually sending. So while you're pulling up, Trusting you here, all 149 of you. Uh, let's, Joe, tell us what we're sending. Sure. So we talked earlier about the uh, separate benefit category bill, and this is a, a related but slightly different legislation that uh, we're pushing right now at the moment when you go to www.protectmymobility.org, as everyone should be doing. Uh, this is a bill. It's called H.R. 2293, uh, the Protecting Access to Wheelchairs Act. And what this would do is it's specifically targeting uh, manual CRT wheelchair accessories. So currently, and this is uh, going to get a little bit a uh, little bit technical, but the way that CMS pays for these accessories uh, differs between power and manual wheelchair accessories. Uh, the payments were scheduled to essentially get a decrease dramatically, which as everyone I'm sure can understand, uh, would also probably decrease the quality and the access to the services that are required to go along with those wheelchairs and accessories. Uh, CMS, again, the Medicare agency, did take action to fix this issue uh, for power wheelchair accessories uh, back in 2017, uh, but unfortunately, the manual CRT accessories have not been permanently fixed. Uh, so right now, this letter that you're sending is asking your congressman to sign on to the bill led by Congressman Larson and Congressman Zeldin, that's H.R. 2293, and ask them to permanently fix the payment rates uh, for CMF, CRT manual wheelchair accessories. Uh, so that's what we're hoping everyone will do, and, and we really encourage you to reach out. This is a very easy way to reach out to your, uh, your congressional representatives. You don't even have to talk to anyone in person. Uh, you're just sending the letter and asking them, a as a CRT advocate, uh, please support this legislation. Yes, and you can easily send that to coworkers, to other uh, of your, the people that you work with, uh, share it around, and uh, let, let the voice be heard. Uh, and from there, you can follow up with a phone call and say, uh, hey, I, I'm Kathy Carver. I work in the UAB wheelchair clinic. Sent you an email about this bill. Want to follow up, make sure you got it and how important it is uh, for our patients to get access to that. So we're going to pause right now and see if there's any questions. Um, I believe uh, we have somebody watching the chat box for us uh, to see if there's been any questions there, if you have for any of the panel or, uh, or for me or for Joe or any of, uh, any of us. I don't know that I can see the chat box. Kathy, um, someone asked, since uh, this particular person's representative is Mark Meadows, since he vacated this his house seat, where will my letter go that I already sent? That's a good question. I, Joe, do you want that? Yeah, sure. I'll take that. Well, again, first of all, thank you so much for taking action. Uh, and you're right that uh, your congressman has vacated his seat, and they're currently in the process of holding a special election to fill that. 
Um, there is still uh, staff, it won't be quite as many staff, but there is still staff representing, I believe that's the North Carolina's 11th district. Uh, so that letter will go to that office. Um, again, it may, it may not be something that necessarily gets acted on uh, right away as there's not a congressman currently to be able to sign on to the bill, uh, but there will be as soon as the special election seat is filled. Uh, and this is a great way to sort of prime that whoever that next representative may be, uh, they'll be able to see that this is an important issue to constituents in their district, their new constituents, and hopefully they'll say, uh, you know, as a new congressperson, I really want to work for my constituents. And so I'm going to go ahead and sign on to this bill. Good question. Any others, Annette? Um, Barbara Kroom commented, hopefully a wheelchair user who is running, that that seat would go to a wheelchair user who's running. And um, Angie has a question what, to one of the therapists. Um, will you explain what people can expect when they call their congressional offices? Who do they talk to? Good question, Angie. Erin, um, do you want that one? Can I pitch it back to you? What happens when you call? Sure. Uh, so more than likely, uh, you will get just a staffer in the office. Um, when you are calling about CRT, you can specifically ask for their health uh, staffer. And if that person's available, they can be put on the phone. If not, you can leave a message with whoever is answering the phone um, about and it'll be, it'll be a brief, here's the bill number that I'm calling about, here's what I want to see happen. And then, you know, you can, you can make it pretty quick. I'm going to, here's the information. Um, can you pass this along to either the health aide, if they're not the one that you are speaking to, um, or if you are speaking to the health aide, can you pass this directly to the congressperson for me? And you know what, I'm going to follow up with you in a week or a few days, whatever timeline you want to give by, via email and, and see where we're at. Um, and then again, like a, before, consistency and persistence. So if you're going to, if you say you're going to follow up, follow up and, and they'll know that you, that you mean it, you, you came to play. <laughs> That's right. I mean, those calls I've always made to have been very brief, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they, they they do take it and they do share it because that is their job and you might get a follow-up email the follow-up email you get might be a stock email uh that's just mm -hmm. one of those they send as response so you can get excited about that but also uh try to reach out to an individual and see if you can have an individual email exchange as well um we got probably time for one more question if there's one. um mia has a question uh she says thank you for this information do you get pushback from insurance companies or are they usually on board with this legislation? Um, you know, I, I think it's sort of two, two different forms of advocacy. Uh, you are advocating for co coverage. So you'll hear three different words kind of as we talk about this stuff. Advocacy for coding, coverage, and payment. So the code is established by Medicare and then they establish how much they're going to pay for that, what the covered item is, and then actually what is paid out. So um, once the legislation is established and then, then the code is applied, then there's coverage and payment that's established. So, um, so it's sort of two different approaches. Does anybody else want to help me out and kind of fill in that gap? Sure, I can add a little bit. Um, these specific bills uh, are targeting Medicare, uh, which of course is the federal payer. So while this bill wouldn't directly inf uh, impact dr uh, private insurance coverage, uh, most private insurance companies tend to sort of take their cues from Medicare. Uh, Medicare does sort of set the stage uh, for a lot of private insurance. So there are certainly uh, private insurance companies that do cover uh, CRT better than Medicare. There are also plenty that cover it worse than Medicare. So in, improving the Medicare coverage of CRT uh, would definitely be a signal and help push sort of a rising tide lifts all boats angle. It would push the insurance companies to do more, uh, more and, and improve their coverage for CRT. Uh, but again, these, these bills, the two that we talked about, 2408 and 2293, uh, would not directly impact private insurers. Tina has a question. Is there a difference with pediatric CRT versus adult CRT in terms of coverage with these bills? Well, like, like Joe mentioned, the uh, Medicare uh, is generally driven toward adults. 
uh, either 65 and older, or if you qualify because you've had a disability more than two years and you've paid into the system. So typically, um, uh, folks under the age of 21 are either covered by their parents or under a state Medicaid type program, uh, not typically covered by Medicare until they're a little bit older. Though, like Joe said, a lot of what Medicare does, other insurances and payer sources do follow. So that's- Yeah, Kathy, if I can jump in on that one? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Kennedy Krieger is actually primarily a pediatric facility. And so uh, in my program, we have a mix of adults and pediatrics. Um, but I will say one thing we have seen, some private insurances are considering the in-the-home restriction for children as well. So um, we have seen denials for equipment that will help a child uh, become more independent at school or for other reasons in the community. Um, we, and because they, and it's a terrifying thought, it's another reason that I'm so motivated to be part of this advocacy movement, um, that they are following Medicare. There's some of these private insurances that are following Medicare to a T and school is outside the home. So mm -hmm. if they can use a manual chair in their house to get from the bedroom to the bathroom, or if they can walk that 10 feet, um, then they are not qualifying for that power chair that will ensure that they can get around school and get to class on time and, and so on and so forth. So this is a bigger issue than just for adults. That's very well said. It's like my seven-year-old said, that's dumb. Um, well, we're running a little short on time. I want to make sure we get to your resources. So any remaining questions you have, we will collect those. Um, and I'll, we'll give you an email address at the end that you can email us directly and uh, our panel will respond to you. Uh, so I want to just make sure we're wrapped up by giving you some resources. There's a few websites there uh, who are very involved on, the, on lots of levels of advocating. And uh, there's a lot of resources on all of those websites. For your clients, um, you can request postcards like this one. I have a stack of these on my desk that I share with my patients and send home with them in their hands that they can uh, get online at home or make phone calls and things like that. Show them the access to CRT website. Um, you, and we've already talked about Protect My Mobility. I wanna share with you, if you're not aware of this My Wheelchair Guide app that is uh, out now that's primarily put out by United Spinal. It's sponsored by uh, CTF and, and Resna was involved in CARD and NARCS. Uh, it's a fantastic app uh, to be able to share with your patients to keep up with things and have the resources right at their fingertips. Uh, so another great resource for your clients. And I want to give a big thank you, especially to NARCS for hosting us today and providing all of our <laughs> administrative and supportive background, helping coordinate your free, free, CEU credit, by the way, free. Thank you for that. Uh, and so appreciate that. Um, thank you to Sunrise Medical, Angie Tiger, for helping us with a lot of the marketing and a lot of the uh, technological stuff. And a lot of what you saw on these slides was, was from, from their support. NCART, uh, amazing resources and advocacy across the entire country. And again, can't thank the clinicians involved with the CTF enough. Uh, for what they're doing, just boots on the ground. We're a bunch of worker bees right beside you all across this country. Uh, and if you're involved, interested in getting involved with us, we would love to have you uh, be involved with some of our work groups and things like that. But don't forget uh, to go to, through the uh, narts.org uh, to the learning portal, portal uh, and do your quiz and give us some feedback on today. Uh, it'll be recorded, share it with your colleagues. We're gonna try to post it around all the major websites so that you can have access to it and share it around. And hopefully today has been a good, a good hour for you, worth your time and uh, good resources for you to share with your colleagues and, and patients out there who wanna move the ADA forward. So really appreciate everybody being a part of this today. Panelists, thank you so much. Uh, you guys have been a joy to work with and this has been fun to put together. Uh, so look forward to uh, seeing this uh, ADA keep rolling forward. So I hope everybody has a great rest of your day.